Kirok. Um, Jeff works professionally as the head of tax for an investment company based in the Navy Yard. Uh, he and Alyssa first joined BZBI in 1997 after they were married by Rabbi Stone. Jeff spent many Shabbatot with his kids, Dylan and Karina, in the back of the sanctuary and was active in BZBI's synagogue leadership for many years before moving to Los Angeles in 2010. Uh, during the Hurok's time in LA on visits to Philadelphia, they would make a point of coming back to BZBI and they've remained connected with many members of our community. Upon returning to the Philadelphia area, the Hurok's have joined us on various Shabbatot over the past five years and Jeff has regularly joined us for our Zoom Shabbatot. Jeff works professional, uh, I said that part already. Uh, so uh, without any further introduction, uh, Jeff, I'm gonna find you and put you on the video here. Okay, Shabbat Shalom everyone. I'm not sure. And, uh, Jeff, hold on one second because I'm gonna make you co-host so you can screen share. Okay. All right, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Rabbi Abe, and thanks to Rabbi Annie as well. Uh, it is really an honor and humbling to be offered to learn with the BGBI community today. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so many years spent in BGBI and now with BGBI. Hopefully the uh, sounds of the suburbs won't interrupt too much as I'm delivering with lawnmowers and crickets and whatever else is going on out here. So um, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to share some Torah with you today, um, especially two weeks after Harris did such a beautiful job. So I'll have to see if I can do something with that. Today I want to, I want to discuss some of the comparisons of the retelling of the stories sure. between Devarim and in particular Parsha Ve'echanan and the maybe events as they actually happened earlier in the Torah and think about some of the reasons for some of the differences and if there are learnings for us maybe as parents, as business leaders, as community leaders, and, and as members. So my question is, I want to think about is when we share stories, things that happened in the past, do we do it differently than they actually happened in the past? Do we change the story either purposely or not purposely to help illustrate or amplify a point? And when we do that, do we do that with the audience that we're talking to in mind? Maybe out of maybe mutual respect for the people to whom we're talking. And maybe because our life experiences have changed, maybe reflecting on those events. So this week we continue to read Moses' words of recounting the events of wandering in the desert and how Moses is pleading with the people to follow this instruction with a capital I that God has provided. And he pleads with God to, again to see if Moses can enter the land and God refuses. So Moses continues to urge the people to take utmost care and watch themselves scrupulously so as not to forget the thing they saw with their own eyes. Of course, that right there is a little different because some of the generation that may have witnessed the redemption out of Egypt and the um, Sinai are no longer with us. So this Parsha notably contains the second version of the Yetzer de Brio, as well as the first paragraph of the Shema. And it also references, as I'm realizing, in some respects, the third paragraph of the Shema, as the beginning of Devarim, at least, talks about the spy story, which I'll get into. From chapter four of this Parsha, on page 1011 of the Eitz Chaim, we learn about the... Um, Moses talking about the consequences of disobedience. And Moses says, when you have begotten children and children's children that are long established in the land, should you act wickedly and make for yourselves a sculptured image in any likeness, causing the Lord your God displeasure and vexation? If you do that, there's a bunch of things in verses 26, 27, 28 that, that will be bad, that will happen, the consequences. But then, this is a nice message afterwards, Moses says in verse 29, but if you search him, search there for the Lord your God, you will find God. If only you seek God with all your heart and soul when you are in distress because of all the things have befallen you and in the end return to the Lord your God and obey God. So this theme of reward for following, the, for following and punishment for straying 
but with the ability for redemption, continues in Devarim. And you can think of next week, Parsha Akev, when we're going to read what becomes the second paragraph for the Shema as well. Not only do these themes resonate with us after coming out of Tisha B'Av, but as we march towards the high holidays as well. But there's something else that intrigues me that I really want to get into. It's an interesting lesson in parenting and leadership. How do we impart upon our children or colleagues at work enough wisdom and instill reason for, reasons for them to learn from us rather than for them to start de novo and learning all on their own? And maybe we should expect people to learn from us, but we need to do that with some humility. Moses emphatically wants the children of Israel to continue with the words, those devarim and the commandments, the mitzvot, when Moses is no longer available because Moses won't enter the land and he won't be able to intercede on their, their behalf. As parents, don't we do the same thing? Don't we want our children to learn from us so they can navigate the world in the future without us plowing the way for them? We want them to grow into their own best selves, but we also want them to preserve the ideals and values that we think are important and we want to impart on them. In our lives, we've developed traditions, adhered to traditions, and have learned a few things. So we desire our progeny to retain, maintain, and hopefully enhance these lessons. How will we do that? What works, the carrot or the stick? And when there's a stick, do we want them to learn and to know that redemption in a hug is waiting? Does that redemption lesson lessen the ability and the effect of the carrot and the stick? So one of my good friends and long-standing members of BZBI, Dr. Eric Berger, used to say, and I think still does say, that for the parent, it's important to discipline dispassionately, but love unconditionally. So maybe the effect of punishment is not lessened if the punishment is there, and then we embrace back. So many people look to the differences in the Etzer Debrio between Yitro when we had the first iteration of the Ten Commandments, he had Sir Debrio, and our Parsha today of Echanan in Deuteronomy, in Devarim. What I'm interested in is where the differences can connote what Moses really wants to convey differently, potentially, about the Sir Debrio, and how that might influence me as a parent and influence my position in the company to impart some learning to the next generation. In our Parsha, Moses implores it's not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but it's with us, the living, and every one of us who's here today. One of the commentators, Abarbanel, says, Torah is given not to solely the original recipients, but to each generation. Another commentator, Grosanides, picks up on this theme to say each generation must think, must think Torah was given to them. So I wanted to show on the screen here, hopefully you can see this, This is a little comparison I did of the various commandments. I'm not going to go through each one of them. The first three pretty much are the same, but then we get to the commandment for Shabbat. Over here on the left is from Parsha Yitro. Remember the Shabbat day and keep it holy. And the reason is for in six days, God made heaven and the earth and all that was in them rested on the seventh day. In our Parsha today, it's a longer version observe rather than remember as many of us know as the lord your god has commanded you and then the reason is because we were slaves in egypt and so god freed us with an outstretched arm so we have observe versus remember and the reasoning is very different as well and so that kind of intrigues me and i know there's lots of classical commentators that go each direction but the commonality is God has a commandment to rec for us to recognize Shabbat. But the reason stated for the commandment is different. So do reasons matter and do they matter for the audience that's listening? For a leader pleading with his people to keep to this nascent tradition coming from the desert and across Jordan, which is more compelling to us potentially as listeners? But as a leader, as a parent, to illustrate a point, might we make a point differently when retelling a story? Or maybe we see fundamental events in our lives later in life differently as we've reflected on how we have evolved due to those events. And then maybe our explanation of how those events shaped us changed over time. 
We desire for the next generation to use how we have evolved based on those events to better themselves. So another example, I'm gonna stop the share here. Another example of changing stories comes from last week's parasha of Devarim and the retelling of the stories of the spies or the scouts, which was in Shlach Lecha originally in, in Bemi Bar chapter 13, which happens to mean by bar, bar, bar Mitzvah portion. And there are differences in that story too. For instance, in Shlach Lecha, God tells Moses to send the scouts, the, the tour, the, the almost tourists, the scouts. And in Devarim, Moses says the people asked for Moses to send the scouts. And Moses says, yeah, that, that's a good idea. So Rabbi Sachs has a whole bunch of commentary about various uses of words of scouts and, and spies in the different portions. But what I really want to get at is what he said last week in his commentary is this account in our Parsha a generation later in Devarim, he says, was meant to inform, but not to inform, but to warn. Shlach is a historical narrative. Our Parsha is a sermon, is what Rabbi Sachs says. So is this also what's going on potentially with the Echanan compare with Parsha Yitro? Later, Rabbi Sachs' commentary last week, he says, following Rashi, the two accounts here and in Shlach are not two different versions of the same event. He says they are the same version of the same event, but split into two. Half told there, meaning in Shlach, and half here, meaning in Devarim. It was people who requested the spies, as stated in Devarim, but Moses took the request to God, and God acceded to the request, but as a concession, not a command. The, ver the comparison is you may send, not you must send, as stated in Shlach. So getting back to our Parsha of today for the Etzer de Briot and Zachor Vishamor, Zachor meaning remember, and Shamor meaning observe, for today's Parsha, Rashi famously comments, but in the former Ten Commandments, it's remember this Shabbat day. The explanation is both of them, Zachor and Shamor, were spoken in one utterance and in one word, as many of us know, as read, and were heard in one hearing or heard simultaneously. So in both stories, Rashi tries to harmonize the two iterations of the fourth commandment as well as, well as the spy story. Many other commentators pick up on this theme. For instance, Chizkuni says in part, when you understand the line, Zahor Yom HaShabbat Lekadsho, from Yitro, keep, and keep, he says, if you understand it as keep on remembering the Shabbat day, to keep it a holy day, it's practically the same as when it says in the second version, Shamor Yom HaShabbat Lekadsho, make sure you observe the Shabbat day. But Ibn Ezra takes a different approach. Ibn Ezra, another commentator, doesn't seem to buy this concept of Shamor and Zahor as, this, as one word. He seems to be more in the concept of Zahor in the wording, the wording in Yitro were God's words and Shamor, what we have today in the Echanon were Moses' words. So what makes more sense to you? Even with Zahuni's interpretation, which maybe is a bridge between the different ideas, to me, observe sounds like a stronger word than to remember. Even if we were to use Rashi and other commentaries approach the classical interpretations that the two words were said at the very same time, how does that explain the other differences? For instance, the reasons for recognizing Shabbat, whether it's because we are the, recognizing the seventh day or whether it's because we were slaves in Egypt. If we remember a lesson of our parents who choose not to abide by that lesson, does it do us any good? As a parent or as a leader or otherwise, or maybe Moses, reparting the desire to observe rather than to remember, maybe that will also help us remember if we're also doing and observing because it sounds more active. If we depart from the tradition and the Rashi concept that God spoke Zahor and Shamor in one word and think of it as Moses' reflection on the Atzer de Briot, to make it more impactful for the people who go into the land. What is Moses doing by making it Shamor? So on safaria.org, which I know many of you are familiar using, there are definitions. If you highlight a word, you can get definitions. So Zahor is defined as to cause to remember, to remind, to mention, to record. Whereas Shamor has some definitions such as to keep, to guard, observe. 
to watch for, to keep, to preserve, to protect. Much stronger words, at least in my view. If the account in the Echanon is full of Moses' pleading and instilling this tradition, maybe the charge to observe is better and stronger as a leadership message, even if not precisely the original text. If so, was that a good idea for Moses to make the change? So another commentary I read from last week came from Dr. Sarah Wald, who's the assistant professor of Talmud and rabbinics at JTS. And she was reflecting again on the differences in the stories, primarily the spy story. In a part she writes, yet they can nonetheless teach us, meaning the differences, an important lesson about even our most cherished and trusted leaders might be influenced by what they want to remember or what they want their followers to remember. And she concludes her remarks by saying, some of these differences in the historical narrative is in part of what it means to grow as a people and to draw closer to the promised land. So might we then change stories because we are growing or want to make points better for others to grow? Can that, should that make us reflect and modify the stories as we tell our children to illustrate learnings that we may have had that we would think we would want our children to have? Should this dynamic influence on how we tell anecdotes in the office or through Zoom, as the case may be today, to explain a concept or a behavior? Should we change them to illustrate differently? Maybe. So I'm happy to discuss further as we proceed more with Moses retelling the trials and tribulations of the desert travels. And I thank you very much for allowing me to learn with you today and, and the honor uh, to do that. So thank you very much. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Yashar Shalom, Jeff. Yashar Koach. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Jeff. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We're going to continue now with the prayer for our country. That's on, I have to switch books here. Um, that's on page 148 uh, at the bottom of the page in Sidor Sim Shalom, and I invite you to read with me in the English. Our God and God of our ancestors, we ask your blessings for our country, for its government, 